Hello, my name is Michael Ilsman, and I work on the Swift Standard Library team at Apple. Konnichiwa, Hiroshima Michael Rudas, Apple no Swift Standard Library team de hataraiteimasu. And this is Zipper. He'll be helping us unravel the mystery of string. Jipa des. A couple years ago, I started asking myself the most important questions in life, such as, what is a string? I began by searching for how strings are used. I asked an app designer how they use strings, and they told me about emoji and locale, and I learned that strings are used to author and present text to people. <coughs> Next, I asked a framework expert how strings are used. They told me about selectors, paths, and most of all, identifiers. I learned that strings are woven into the very DNA of the systems and frameworks that we program with. And next, I asked, I asked a Unix expert how strings were used, and she told me about files and text streams. I learned that strings are used as an interchange format for computing. Now these are ways that strings are used, but I wanted to dig deeper. So I asked a theoretical physicist, what is a string? He told me about one dimensional objects permeating space time. I didn't learn very much from him. <laughs> but fortunately, I came across a bird. And that bird told me that Swift's string type provides a fast Unicode compliant way to work with text in your code and thus began my quest to find the legendary philosopher's string, a strange alchemical substance that can convert Unicode into something that makes sense. <laughs> and I would like to share with you all today what I found so that you can join me for the next phase of this journey, making string fun. Swift string type aims to strike the optimal balance between correctness, performance, and ease of use. Correctness, a good API pushes users towards correct use and away from incorrect use. And performance is vital. Strings are used everywhere on modern systems. And of course, ease of use. An API that is obnoxious will be circumvented, often at the price of correctness and performance. So why are strings so hard? <laughs> I ask myself that question every day. Well, when you think about it, strings have to deal with, with all the inherent complexity of human writing systems, which are full of contradictions. And on top of that, the complexity of Unicode and its commitment to compatibility, which is sometimes another word for complexity. And all of this needs to run fast on modern hardware, on real computers. And that adds another dimension of complexity to strings. So what should a string be made out of? That is, what is a character? Some programming languages present the content of a string as a collection of integers in some encoding, such as UTF-8 or UTF-16. This isn't the right default for Swift. It's too easy to make assumptions about the encoding width of the content. Some recent programming languages present strings as a collection of Unicode scalar values. This is much better. But the first graphical emoji here is actually encoded as four separate scalars. So it's still too easy to bake in assumptions in our code about the scalar width of our characters. And so string by default, so string by default is a collection of Unicode extended graphing clusters, which Swift just calls characters. This is the closest approximation that we have to a user perceivable character. Choosing the right default behavior is one of the most important design decisions in string. A good default avoids common bugs that are inherent in handling anything as complex as Unicode. A good default exhibits uniform behavior, which means it does not make any assumptions about the content or the reader of the string. And uniform behavior means that we see consistent behavior at runtime, even if the programming environment changes. And a good default has to have acceptable performance where it counts. 
viewing the contents of a string as a collection of extended graphing clusters eliminates bugs, it makes no assumptions about the content or user reading the string, and string's implementation is optimized such that you only pay the more expensive analysis for those characters that actually need it. Now with Unicode, things are sometimes a little fuzzy around the edges. Sometimes there is no correct answer, and all we can do is evaluate between different trade-offs. Unicode specification allow for what are called degenerate graphemes. These are characters that don't arise naturally, but they exhibit counterintuitive behavior. Here, the string degenerate is a combining acute accent character, which means that it actually modifies the character that comes before it. So when we concatenate these strings, we see that the E now has a combining act, now has an acute accent over it, but the total number of characters has not changed. This violates algebraic reasoning, and as programmers, we love our algebraic reasoning. This is actually why string lost collection conformance in Swift 3, but that turned out to hurt ease of use a lot. Now, Unicode deliberately chose to ignore the existence of, deliberate, of degenerate graphemes for the sake of simplicity and performance. Unicode says that, meh, they don't really come up that often anyways. Well, okay, but what about when they do? We need to have some behavior. How can String interpret Unicode's guidance while seeking to find the optimal balance between correctness, performance, and ease of use? So first, don't compromise the model just because these are theoretically possible. Preserve ease of use. String must remain a collection. Second, don't waste resources going out of your way to detect these scenarios. For example, we could try to detect all possible cases this could happen and insert a bunch of invisible breaking scalars in the middle, but that would hurt the performance of all strings, even strings that don't do this. And even if we did that, that doesn't fix the problem because now the Unicode scalar view sees a whole bunch of scalars that it wasn't expecting. There's, there is no right answer here. And finally, if you can't be pedantically correct, at least have well-defined behavior. So don't delete user data, don't compromise system security, and so forth. Do something reasonable if you can't do something heroic. Next, let's look at how we order strings. How should an O with a diuresis over it compare to the letter Z? A German user might say that it is clearly less than Z, but a Swedish user could say the opposite. Human ordering is locale sensitive. By convention, ka with a prolonged vowel marker compares less than ka a without. But of course, ki compares greater than ki a. Here, the vowel ex ex extending character compares differently depending on the character that came before it. This means that human ordering is context sensitive. Now, the vast majority of string comparisons are never presented to a human user. They're used for algorithmic purposes, such as searching, sorting, and dictionary lookup. What we need from string is a default ordering that is appropriate for machine consumption, a machine ordering. This ordering needs to eliminate bugs. Comparing Unicode rich strings is a common source of problems. A, a precomposed E with a cute accent over it must compare equal to E followed by a combining accent character. This ordering should not change if the programming environment does change. Array is a value type. If we created it, sort it, it needs to remain sorted even if the user's locale changed while our program was running. And ordering and comparison need to be fast. Sets, and especially string key dictionaries, are performance critical users of string.
To get the equality behavior we want, we choose to honor Unicode canonical equivalence because it eliminates bugs. Machine ordering should be consistent and not change if the locale does. We want mathy goodness. So, string, so less than on strings should be transitive, irreflexive, anti-symmetric, lexicographical, <laughs> basically consistent the way that you expect programming to be. And since this is for machine consumption, the exact ordering is completely arbitrary. So let's just go with whatever's fastest. Canonical equivalence is, is done by viewing the content of a string in a normal form. You may have heard of NFC, NFD, NFKC, NFKD, or even FCC if you're hip. These are all normal forms. Since NFC is the most memory compact normal form, most string content in the wild is already in NFC, so we just use that. Now, if you want to be popular at parties like I am, just keep reminding everyone that string comparison follows the lexical graphical ordering of Unicode scalar values in NFC. Now, there are times where you want behavior that is different than the default. A machine ordering is not appropriate for human consumption. A human user expects two to compare greater than one, but they would also expect two to compare less than 11. For that, we use localized standard compare, which gives us a non-lexical graphical comparison. And there are situations where you need to drop down to a lower level for more precise control. For example, Unicode encodes the semicolon and Greek question mark separately, but they compare canonically equivalent. And so string comparison and character comparison honors this canonical equivalence. But if you're trying to process a textual format that uses an ASCII semicolon as a separator, then you do not want that to compare equal to a Greek question mark. If you come across a Greek question mark, it's part of the content of your string. It's not a separator. And so for that, we drop down to the Unicode scalar view, which is a more appropriate semantic level. This gives us a literal comparison. Pick the right view for the job. Now let's look at how a focus on correctness, performance, and ease of use has played out over the history of string. Swift 3 was the first source stable release, which meant that the APIs had to be right. Focus was on correctness above all else. Swift 4 brought in Swift 4 built on this and restored collection conformance for string, which is a vital ease of use improvement. Multi-line string literals, my personal favorite feature, was also developed during Swift 4. And it was, done it was driven entirely by the open source community. And Swift 4 brought important performance improvements, such as faster character iteration. And Swift 4.1 and 4.2 brought memory savings, small string representations, and faster comparisons. And Swift 5 builds on this further. It adds character properties, Unicode scalar properties, raw string literals, and custom string interpolations. And in Swift 5, string pivots to UTF-8 as is preferred in coding. This brings further win in performance, code size, and the usefulness of Swift for low-level programming. There's a new blog post up yesterday on Swift.org that I wrote where you can find out, we can read much more about this. So now that you understand some of the philosophy behind string and the history of string and Swift, I would like to invite each one of you to join me for the next phase of this exciting journey. Looking forwards, 
what should, we, what should string prioritize? Of course, correctness is important, and there's plenty of awesome performance work to, to be done, but I think we should shift more of the focus on ease of use. Now, ease of use is a broad topic, and I wrote several forum posts this week. Unicode Enthusiasts Unite is about surfacing Unicode details to programmers. Piercing the string veil is about exposing strings internal ABI for high performance usage. Sculpting strings is all about more ergonomic string formatting. String consumption talks about consumers, regular expressions, parsing expression grammars, text streams. String mutations is all about modifying strings and string essentials cover generally applicable must haves. Tsuyaku no kata, otsukare sama desu. So these things include things such as find and replace, uh, retrieving a character or a substring from integer offset, and string formatting, which we'll be looking at later. The greatest strength of open source Swift is the diversity of perspectives that come from the community. No one person or team or even company can do this. It takes a community. Share your experience. Each one of you brings a unique perspective. And the more real world use cases that we see, the, more that we as a the better that we as a community can make stream. You have common utilities that you use in all of your projects. Starting with a, something concrete and generalizing it out to something more broadly applicable is a great way to get started. Do you have code that would be made better from some of these improvements? Share your code. Real code fuels motivation and it helps the community converge on a solution. And finally, is there something that you feel like you should be able to express more cleanly, but you don't have the tools or you don't even know how to express it, go to the forums, forums.swift.org. The using Swift category is a very beginner-friendly place to ask for help and feedback on your code. So let's close by working through one of these areas, formatting strings. We'll use the new custom interpolations in Swift 5 to write cleaner code, producing something that we can propose as a useful addition to the standard library. When I was preparing this talk, I needed a function that printed out information about a Unicode scaler, similar to some of those Unicode Explorer tools that you see online. The printout should include the value, followed by its name, and a lot of other information as well. To start, let's try printing the value of a Unicode scalar in what's called Unicode code point notation, which is a U followed by a plus, followed by the hexadecimal value of the number. Here, I need to construct a string inside my interpolation, specifying the radix and capitalization strategy. But this could be nicer. Interpolating a number as a hex digit is something that I do all the time. In Swift 5, I can define my own custom interpolations. Let's define a convenience one for interpolating numbers as hex digits. When the compiler sees an interpolation, it looks for an overload of a pinned interpolation inside of the conformer's interpolation type. In this case, for string, it's default string interpolation. So let's extend it and provide an overload with the argument labels and the types that we want to use inside of the interpolation. Here, I form the string as before, and then I just forward it on to the normal string interpolation. Let's see how a use of this looks. The interpolation labels correspond to our argument labels on a pinned interpolation, and this makes the use site look much nicer. But this last result is a little bit off. Code point notation likes to pad the value out to a minimum width of four. Now, padding is also something that I do all the time, so let's define a custom interpolation for that. 
Here I want to add padding to the left of a given, of a given string up to a given column width and using a provided character, by default, space. I calculate how much filler I need, zero if the content is already wide enough. I then make the filler and interpolate it to the left of my content. Now, if interpolating Unicode scalars in code point notation is something that I'm going to be doing a lot, I could even define a custom interpolation for that. Here, I construct the code point value by using my hex interpolation, and then I pad it out as needed. And now when we use it, we get the results that we want. Now we're ready to write the whole function. First, I'll write a helper to interpolate optional values with an alternative if that happens to be nil. For the output, I'll use a multi-line string literal as a sort of two-dimensional template that I can punch holes out of and fill in values using interpolations. First, we interpolate the scalar. And then after that, on the next indented line, we print out its Unicode code point notation and then its name, if it has one. The next line has the age or the version of Unicode that was introduced. And after that, we have the general category and numeric value, if it has one. And we did it. It works. We get the output that we wanted. So take this technique and use it in your own code. The best way to discover new possibilities is through experimentation. Custom interpolations can be used for your own types that conform to expressible by string interpolation. You can use these to add expressivity and safety to your types. Second, look for patterns. What is it that makes some things work well and other things not work so well? When does it make sense to have a custom interpolation versus a new initializer for string versus a computer property on your type? And share what you find. Blog about it, tweet about it, and discuss it on the forums, forums.swift.org. Patterns that you find useful could become part of Swift. And the custom interpolations that you discover you can't live without could become part of the Swift standard library. String needs better formatters, and custom string interpolations are a part of that. And this is a great way for anyone to get involved. Arigato gozaimashita. Kigaru ni koe o kakete kudasai. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of the conference. I'll be around. My office hours are at 4.40 p.m. Make sure to say hi. I'll also be at the Contributing to Open Source Swift workshop tomorrow, where you can learn how to contribute to open source Swift. I'm looking forward to seeing each and every single one of you there tomorrow. <laughs>